Welcome back. This is the Royal Edition of the News Gang, and we're still here with Professor Masharia Munene, who's a historian. Uh, Prof, while we still have you, I, I wanted to um, bring it a little bit to um, uh, modern day and uh, present times. Um, and I just want to ask you if you can uh, perhaps do this a little quickly because we want to get through to some more um, issues. What do you think is the significance of, of, of the king's visit, um, you know, right after his coronation, um, considering issues back at home? I mean, there's a, a rising sense of disenchantment among the younger populations who are now themselves dealing with issues like student debt, the high cost of living, unaffordable housing. Um, there was a recent poll um, that was done a couple of weeks ago in September, where 18 to 24 year olds amongst that age group, only 30% said the monarchy is good for Britain and um, compared with 77% amongst the older population, that's those who are 65 and above. And if you take a look at this same poll, if you track this poll, it's been done you know, over the last decade or so. Um, about 10 years ago, the same a similar poll found only 17% wanted an elected head of state. But in the latest survey, that number has gone up to 26%. Um, and some say this is something that uh, the monarchy should really think about, whether they're still popular, whether there's value for money. And then here comes uh, the king who's recently coronated and starting to make his trips and forays into the Commonwealth. Does this trip do anything for him at home? Well, it's a good diversion from domestic challenges, uh, as you enumerate them. I think uh, the trip is good for both Charles and, uh, and Ruto, uh, because both have their own problems uh, in their particular countries. So it's good PR. But I think if we can stress and uh, convince the British citizens, uh, which I think is what is maybe trying to do, that the Commonwealth, um, which reminds them of their great uh, times as an imperial entity, uh, is good for Britain. And uh, so if the people can be convinced that the Commonwealth is good, of which he is the head, and he is going out there to remind countries in the Commonwealth that he is there as their head, and they have accepted that as the reality, it is good. It's good diversion from some of the challenges at home. Uh, Prof, wherever he goes, he'll be getting some publicity. Yeah, Prof, and do you think... Support. Uh, Prof, let me jump in. Do you think this helps him with, um, or helps the United Kingdom with countries like Scotland and Wales that, you know, uh, there's waning support there. There's all of these uh, attempts at breaking away and uh, gaining independence. Does this help at all with, with some of those? Because those issues are um, extremely local as opposed to them seeing themselves as a part of the Commonwealth. Well, there have been uh, the Scots mainly and the Irish, mm -hmm. and the Wales, uh, they may want to loosen the, the tight control that England has on them. And there's always that group of people who feel they were colonized, although they are in the British Isles. And, uh, sometimes the, the Scots would joke about being uh, controlled by the English, and therefore they have problems with the, with the English. But I think um, it is the trip is good for him as a monarch. Whether it translates to be good for England, for Britain as a whole, is another matter. It depends on how he's received and how they interact, and whether this will lead to more uh, wealth uh, flowing into England or not. If there is more poverty uh, <coughs> in England. Uh, his trips may not matter very much. But if there is, seems to be some glowing uh, appreciations and love for the monarch uh, and the monarch in, in other places, it will uh, infiltrate the home base. But yes, there is growing uh, disenchantment with the uh, royalty. Um, but it's not a new thing. It's been a two or three hundred year uh, trend from the time when the king used to be absolute, mm -hmm. 
to a place, uh, position that now he appears to be virtually powerless where it comes, uh, although things are done in his name. So what we see, some of those things, is a continuation of a process that might have started uh, two to three hundred years ago. Yeah, okay. All right, Prof. Um, and also, I guess, in the context of pop culture, Prince Harry breaking away, uh, well, maybe it's a bleep, maybe it's nothing, you know, let's see what happens. Well, just going by the enthusiasm that greeted the inauguration, and I remember the wonderful television pictures, uh, a lot of people lining up the streets and uh, welcoming the new king. I, I think it's a, it's a deep tradition. The monarchy is a very deep tradition in the UK. Uh, it may divide them sometimes, but uh, looking at those pictures, it's going to be a long conversation and a long time mm -hmm. before we see the uh, uh, public uh, majority, you know, uh, going against the monarchy. I think it's a very, very strong tradition. But Prof, I want to bring you back here uh, at home and one of the questions that have been dominant uh, in this uh, whole issue of uh, uh, the, the departure of the colonial uh, rulers and the incoming of the uh, Kenyan government is the issue of land. And there was a clause in the constitution then that it's a willing buyer, willing seller uh, principle to determine how land is given back to uh, Kenyans. And to that program, uh, it is said that a lot of money was put by the British government as it was leaving for the purchase of that land. Prof, do you have an idea where that money went to? It's a contentious um, issue, and maybe it's said that uh, some people who are said to have been part of the Kapengoria 6 ended up quarreling with some other prominent people asking where the money went. Uh, because there was said to be some money. The whereabouts of that money became an, uh, a different issue. Yes, they are supposed to be helping in terms of land acquisition because the British, the settlers, they were compensated properly for whatever they had. Now, where the, how the whole thing worked is a different matter, uh, depending on whom you are reading. Uh, I think Duncan Dego has uh, his book, uh, something about walking in Kenyatta's footsteps. Uh, there is a section where he dealt with the land uh, distribution and all those kind of things, um, but sometimes may not have been uh, as clear as possible. The willing buyer, willing seller principle um, was favorable to those who had uh, respectable jobs or who had money. And at the time, the people who seemed to have money and the jobs were the home guards. So they could access credit and they could get the money, whatever is needed. So mostly they did that. So the land distribution became a, a very big problem because there was also cheating. Uh, we had those land buying companies where people were cheated out of their money and the land ended up with uh, some tycoons in the whole thing. The settlement schemes, they started before independence. And the people were settled in different places uh, throughout the country. And there was claim that uh, some areas may not be suitable for settlement, so take them somewhere. So what the Kenyatta government did is to continue with what the British have started in a different way, um, uh, which some people benefited. Although there were questions occasionally, you go and see a settlement scheme, and the former Mzungu house belongs to a minister or another leading politician uh, of the days. And, and uh, with that house, sometimes there will be the 20 acres around it. So there were some funny dealings with the uh, settlement schemes and with the land distribution. Not everybody got land. And most people who had lost their land during the emergency, continued being landless. And that's part of the reason why there is a lot of bitterness uh, in the country about the land issue. But, but yeah, yeah it's, well, there is bitterness indeed, uh, uh, Prof. And should this be 
an internal uh, conversation that doesn't involve the British, because you referred to Duncan Degwa's book, and I remember reading sections of it as well, uh, where Kenyatta went to Olkalao and saw uh, a house uh, that had, I think, 24 rooms and many chimneys. And he said the natives there were lighting fires all over the place. And he, on the spot, created a law that said that, um, uh, you, you know, the land can only be distributed to those who can afford 100 acres and above if it's such, it has got such uh, property and actually got one of, 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 of them and called it, in, I think, in a language you understand better, Neka Minoga. Um, I, I Minoga. Yes. So basically thanking him, his, his body or, or, or something like that. And, and then 10 years later, in 1973, um, Taita Taveta, the land where Basil Criticos is uh, uh, involved, basically they divided with the with, um, Kenyatta, taking over 45,000 yeah. acres. Now, 60 years down the line uh, of our independence, is there an internal way of addressing uh, these issues? It is, there should be, but it is very difficult, given that the people who are even now grabbing the land are very powerful, and they are not going to change uh, to deny themselves the opportunity to become bigger landowners uh, in various parts. Um, yes, it should be an internal discussion, conversation, but the willingness to have that conversation does not seem to be there. That's a problem. Uh, yes, there should also be conversation with Britain because uh, there may be some pending issues that were not properly addressed. And um, the future of the huge... Uh, can, can, can you just make owners, clear uh, for, for, um, uh, prof, for everyone strong. to... Uh, prof, you say that there are issues that the British need to address that are pending. Which issue is that? Well... I think the conservancies are some of the things that may need to be looked at. The Kenyan cowboys and the future of the Kenyan cowboys who are now, they have left uh, Karen and they seem to be flocking to Laikipi and Samburu and those other places. And then the ratio factor, which is still there in some places, uh, because um, the whole issue, the problem with Batuk and uh, the misbehavior of some uh, the soldiers there, which sometimes it appears as if there is effort to cover up until it is uh, uh, brought out by the media. Uh, the media have been doing some good work when they get to know of some things like that. So the the equal relation the, uh, today, Britons just show up at the airport and they get a visa without even bothering. They just pay the fifty pounds of dollars and they get in. Kenyans trying to go to Britain are harassed and they don't get it. Uh, uh, they take time uh, before they can even be told that they, they are getting it. That's, that's an issue in terms of response, uh, reciprocity. President Ruto keeps on talking about opening up the, the border for people to come in and up, but uh, we wait to see the reciprocity part of it. Not just the British, but also other um, uh, countries who just walk in at the airport and say I'm a tourist or whatever it is, and they get it. That's an issue that is uh, uh, concern, of concern. Maybe you should go back to what it was when, uh, before the British entered the EU, and then um, there seemed to be better relation because Kenyans used to go to, to London and uh, they. They would go in and out without being harassed too much. Since then, harassment has been the, the norm from the British side and not from the Kenyan side. Mm -hmm. Instead, from the Kenyan side, we almost beg the British to come for free. And the other side, they, they don't trust us. Some of the ambassadors, the high commissioners, have been obnoxious in the country. And I will not name some of them because they, I think they are well known. But, but uh, Prof, but Prof, surely, Prof, is it, yes. is it their fault that we are weak? 
No, it's not their fault they are, that we are weak. It's our fault. Because what they, are, they may be doing is looking after their perceived interests, the way they think how. And then if we have the wrong people in positions of responsibility, then they project weakness and uh, reluctance to think. In fact, uh, one of the weaknesses that we have as a country is that we don't support think tanks or we don't support thinking and policy questions. And therefore, we tend to uh, rely on outsourcing thinking and the so-called advisors of this kind or the kind of telling what you should be doing this, you should be doing that, and uh, totally ignore uh, some of the people who can be helping in some areas. So the weakness is in our part, not knowing how to protect our interests by relying on somebody else. But, but Prof, is there a solution? Prof, is there a solution because every five years we have an election and people wake up very early to go and cast their ballots. Yeah, the people that are, you get in office, you're saying they have to outsource the thinking. Is there a solution here? Yes, there is a good solution, which some people may not want to hear. We have, as a country, for a long time, ignored history. And we have had ministers of education telling children that history is useless, which means knowing having an identity is useless. Because if you don't have a proper identity, then you don't even don't know what you are protecting in the first place. And you will not even be able to tell when um, somebody is out to and I cut you because they sometimes tend to know more about you than you know about them. And that is a mistake. So the solution, long-term solution, maybe the curriculums you are revising almost every, I don't know how many years, need to be stressed that from baby school to the universities, people should be made to study their history, the history of Kenya, the history of Africa, not as a choice, mm. but mandatory, compared to other countries that appear to be stronger. You cannot graduate in a university in the United States without studying American history. Why? Because they want you to be aware of the identity and uh, you have reflex. Yeah. When something is wrong, you are there to defend because you know it. You don't have to be told. The Scandinavian countries have the same thing. Um, saying, you know, before you can go anywhere, do you know your country properly? Its history, its background, its everything. So that you know what the interests are. When the time comes, it will be automatic defense. Patriotism will become automatic. Yeah. And patriotism is not singing songs on special days. <laughs> it is an attitude that needs to be cultivated which can be done properly through history. Absolutely. Uh, those are some good parting shots from you, Professor Masharia Munene. Need to make it um, mandatory for us to learn our history, and that's the only way we build um, our patriotism. And um, I guess it's ironic for me that it takes a visit of the king from our former colonial masters for us to actually start having deeper discussions and debates about our history. Professor Mashara Manene, thank you very much for being our guest here on News Gang tonight, taking us down history, down memory lane, and helping us understand who we are, and also our part to play, um, you know, post-independence. Uh, I guess these are some of the conversations we need to have. Thank you so much for spending your evening with us here on the program. So, gentlemen, um, this is where we leave it. I... I like that. It must be mandatory for us to know some of these things.